message. I, uh, I just got in on Wednesday from Jordan, and uh, I flew home to California, and then I flew back here. So you could ask, why are you doing that? <laughs> and the answer is, because uh, I live in California, and it is nice to see my family once in a while. Uh, but it, it seems to be a, a challenged uh, challenged proposition these days because I've been gone a lot this year. Um, before I get going, I want to uh, be sure to acknowledge my friend David Wagner, who's sitting over here on the front, and uh, he and I are leading this conference jointly. So I'm I'm speaking tonight. Um, tomorrow we'll lead a uh, joint session, and then um, he'll have the lead tomorrow night. You don't want to miss David. Trust me, you don't want to miss him. And we're intentionally making this not just you know, a Ken conference, but a Ken and David conference, which is easy because my middle name is David, so there you go. <laughs> anyway, um, so our theme tonight is, um, the, oh, wait a minute, do we have slides? Am I supposed to do something with slides? I don't know. We'll do those tomorrow. Oh, here we go. Okay. So we have an app, Orbis Ministries. You can point your phone at that QR code and download the app. We have a lot of free teaching. We post some conferences and things there. Our main website, orbisministries.org, we're on all the social media platforms. You probably know what the symbols mean. Um, we use the same handle everywhere, Orbis Ministries, CA, USA. It's long and cumbersome because that's what it took to find one that wasn't taken anywhere that would therefore be universal and nobody would have to remember, well, over here they're called this and over there they're called that. Um, anyway, that's where you can find us. Uh, my book came out in June. It's available on the back table. If you'd like to buy a copy, we have it here. Woo! And I'll even autograph it if you, if, you, if you can get me away from the crowds. Uh, anyway, so it's a, it's a diary of things that I saw in the last decade. And uh, the publisher kind of pushed me to include some newer stories. And I said, well, I don't keep a travel log now like I did then because I'm so busy traveling. I don't have time to write all that up at night. I go home and collapse because I'm tired from the meetings. Um, and we have a school of ministry if you want to learn uh, kind of how we do what we do. Uh, OrbisSM.com, the SM stands for School of Ministry. Clever, don't you think? And uh, again, there's a QR code. And then we have a prayer ministry network. So you might have come tonight or tomorrow uh, wanting a prayer. We'll try to get to everyone we can, but now and then that doesn't happen. We've got a pretty good sized crowd. I don't know if you can tell, but there's a few empty seats, but not many uh, in this room. So orbisprayer.org, you can sign up and get prayer. And I really want to emphasize this. We have a conference coming up in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, October 18, which is a Wednesday to Saturday, October 21. Uh, the subtitle of the Fusion Conference is When Prophecy and Miracles Merge or Converge. Uh, we've got some fairly well-known speakers, if you're following the renewal, uh, who will be uh, part of what we're doing. And uh, we've got all of our mugs up there. If you want to register, again, you can point your phone at that QR code and get signed up. I think we're about ready to have a price increase. I'm not sure exactly when it is, but I know it's Se coming soon. September 17th. 17th, okay. So you've got a few days of runway. Uh, you might want to... Think about registering now if you can get yourself to Nashville. This will be a very unusual conference. We'll have speakers at general sessions, but we're gonna have a lot of activations, workshops, panel discussions. Um, our goal is to get people pushed along, uh, not just into the ministry of healing, but the ministry of miracles, and to understand what the prophetic culture has to do with that. I've got a lot I could say about it. In fact, I could do a whole message on it tonight, but I'm not gonna do that. Uh, just get yourself signed up and come to Nashville, and uh, we'd love to see you there. We are uh, nearing about a third full, and we're five weeks out, and I imagine in the next couple of weeks we're gonna get a lot of registrations. There's a possibility this will sell out. I'm not threatening, I'm just saying it may actually happen. So anyway, there you go, all right. Good, I'm glad I did that. Usually I forget all the commercial announcements. Um, so tonight, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna undertake a small, unambitious task, and that is to try to give you a manifesto of life. Um, that was supposed to be funny. That joke <laughs> fell flat on its face. David, you better come up here and rescue me. Uh, 
The scripture says in the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verse 26, I tend to read the more traditional translations of the Bible. Uh, so my Bible says, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. But I think it's quite clear, uh, most translators acknowledge this, theologians acknowledge it. When we say sons of God, this is kind of an inclusive noun that includes both men and women. So we could also say sons and daughters and uh, not leave anybody behind. You're all sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And if you are a son of God, if you are a daughter of God, then you have been brought into the kingdom of God. Because part of what uh, becoming a son or a daughter means is to become a citizen of God's kingdom, God's rule and reign. Now the word kingdom needs a little unpacking. Uh, many people think of the kingdom as a geographical entity. And a better way to think about it is it's a dynamic realm that can expand and contract. Expand and contract. And so sometimes the kingdom might seem very small. There's not a lot of it on evidence, except in this very restricted area. And other times it's quite expansive and you might be in a, in a huge uh, realm or a move of God, an entire region may come under the touch of God. And we're all part of that realm, we all live in that realm, but we don't always know exactly how much of it we're going to see in a given locale. So we start with this premise that we're sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. But you know, that's a deceptively simple statement. It's true, but it's deceptively simple. And because it's deceptively simple, uh, oftentimes people throw it around glibly without actually thinking through, what does this actually mean? So think of Jason Bourne. Now I am uh, blessed to live with a well, I don't just live with her, I'm married to her. Uh, but I, I live with a woman who loves these sort of mm, techno-thriller... Uh, action. Action. action movies that involve some kind of government intrigue. <laughs> and so we've watched the Jason Bourne movies in our house more than once. There's a few others that go in this same vein, Syriana and a, a bunch of others. But anyway, let's go to Jason Bourne. You know, the fundamental question in the Jason Bourne series, and there's th three of these movies, as I recall, uh, the fundamental question is, who am I? Jason Bourne is a man who's been taken into a government program. He's been trained to be a weapon himself, um, and he has amnesia about who he is. He has various passports. He is skilled in many different things, not all of them kind, gentle, and patient. Um, he's a trained killer. Uh, but, but Jason Bourne is on a quest. He's trying to figure out, who am I? And I think this is actually one of the fundamental questions of the modern age. And it directly bears on this matter of the kingdom of God and uh, whether we are living out the sonship or the daughtership that we have received through faith in Christ. And so with that, we could ask the question, have you ever wanted to be someone else? And a lot of times people change identities. In fact, we're seeing a lot of that going on in our society today. Um, they may adopt an alias or maybe a fictitious business name, or maybe we call it a DBA to separate their professional life from their personal <laughs> life. This is uh, fairly bread and butter stuff, nothing particularly controversial about it. But sometimes they're doing this because perhaps they have a criminal record and they're trying to cover their tracks. They don't want others who might come in contact with them to know about that criminal past. Now, if they're trying to rehabilitate themselves, you might think, well, okay, we'll give them a pass for that. On the other hand, sometimes they're trying to repeat criminal behavior that got them in trouble to begin with. And so this new persona is really no better than the old one it just seems to be a clean slate until it too becomes tarnished. And then we may have people who are creating online personas. Uh, many people do this with their Facebook profile or in some of the more, um, I don't know what to say, uh, adventuresome uh, websites, uh, places like MySpace or uh, Tinder, places like that. 
what they're really doing is they're trying to create um, an image. Whether or not it's real is another question. If they're a gamer, they might have an avatar. All of this is designed to represent who they wish to be. They're questing for something. They're seeking a reality that they don't really live in. Um, and so when we think about it as, it as it goes further, we may think of people who, for example, have decided to change their gender or their sex. Now, it's a controversial topic, and I know it can be very touchy to some people, but when we think of some of the controversy that went around when this all began to be mainstreamed, particularly with one particular athlete, um, Bruce Jenner, who became Caitlyn Jenner, and all that emerged in that dialogue a few years ago, what we realize is that many people feel a deep conflict within themselves. They really don't know how to reconcile who am I, how do I feel, what do I think, what do I wish I were, and all of these um, various identity issues, avatars, <laughs> a sex change, um, fictitious business name and more, all of these are false identities. And I want to suggest to you that one of the most fundamental things we do in the kingdom of God is we get squared away on who we are. Yeah. You'll hear people glibly say identity is the center of everything. Do you know your identity in Christ? And the answer is most people don't. They can say they do. It's become a shibboleth. It's become a mantra. It's become a thing that we talk about. But are we squared away in that? And this conference is actually kind of targeted at the prophetic this weekend, but I'm going to suggest that for many people, the thing that holds them back, not just from their fundamental identity, but from moving on into that uh, prophetic identity or that calling that God has for them, is conflict around who they are and an inability to reconcile what they experience in life, who they are on the inside, and various things that pull at them. And so, as I said, it's a, it's a small, unambitious goal, but I, I hope that before I'm done here tonight, we will have somehow given you a manifesto on life. Now, I made a fundamental mistake here when I started, and that is I forgot to set my timer. So I don't know how long I've been talking. <laughs> I'm usually pretty good about doing that, so let me do it now, and I'll take 10 minutes off, and maybe that'll be enough. I'm not sure. But anyway... Um, <laughs> That shows you I just got back from Oman. <laughs> so for those who are Christians, for those who are sons and daughters of God, that change of identity or that becoming grounded in identity means first accepting the identity that we've been given by God and um, adopting that identity. And if you're a man, then it would be a son of God. And if you're a woman, then it would be a daughter of God. And living from that center, we are literally called to live from the inside out. I think a lot of times people think if they adopt a series of behaviors, uh, that will be enough. But that's actually living from um, what we call works. What we do is supposed to give us meaning. And many people falter on that point because they are fundamentally living from works. Paul talks about all of this in his letters to the Romans and to the Galatians. Um, and we'll talk about that in more detail as we go through this material tonight. But when we think about um, living from that center, what that does is it gives us integrity because we are being congruent, which I'll explain in a moment. We're being congruent with who God says we are. And with that, we come into agreement with God's words over us. And as we come into agreement with that, it releases uh, joy, it releases power, it releases success and breakthrough. Now, any, any identity that's misaligned with God's purposes, it defeats the congruence that God wants us to live in. So when we talk about this congruence, what we're really talking about is what Paul says in Ephesians 1.10. It was the intention of the Father to unite all things in Christ, to create unity, or integration would be another word we could use. And so the whole becomes greater than the sum of the parts when this is played out correctly. Who we are in Christ is far better and far more powerful than who we are apart from him. 
integrity leads to that synergy that's living from the center synergy leads to congruence and congruence leads to convergence so integrity synergy congruence convergence when jesus started his ministry we have an account in the gospel of luke where this begins to happen for him and jesus is he's our divine pattern it says that uh, in John, uh, excuse me, Luke chapter 3, verse 21. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Now most people understand, at least theoretically, theologically, that Jesus is the Son of God. They, they know that that's a fundamental Christian doctrine. So why in the world would Jesus, the Son of God, need to hear the Father speak over him, you are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased? And the answer is because it was going to be challenged. And just as with Jesus, so also with us. Many times we don't really understand that sonship or daughtership. It gets challenged. And what happens? Jesus gets baptized. This is the story of his baptism. I was at that, bapt that baptismal site, not the other one that some of you may have visited up near the Sea of Galilee. And we baptized about 10 people in the Jordan River at that site just a couple of days ago. And interestingly, I, I think it was a prophetic sign, but, um, but the dove didn't land on us. A dove did come down and it landed on a little platform of wood. Aww. Now interestingly, this is just kind of fun facts to you know, illustrate concept where we were was uh, in Jordan and the way the international line runs it runs literally right down the center of the Jordan River but at that point nowadays wasn't so in Jesus's time but nowadays the distance from Jordan to Israel at that exact location is about from me to the front row wow. and so when that dove landed it was almost within reach didn't land on us, but it wasn't bothered by what we were doing, baptizing people. There were soldiers there carrying rifles, because we were right on the frontier between the two countries. And this dove came down and landed as we were baptizing people in this <laughs> bit of a muddy ditch uh, that's called the Jordan River at that location. now. So this dove comes down, and it says the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form and a voice came from heaven saying, You are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. If you go on and keep reading, which we're not going to do tonight, but if you go on and keep reading in Luke chapter 4, Jesus goes into the wilderness and he gets challenged three times by Satan. And in two of them, Satan says, If you are the son of God. So is this a fundamental challenge? It is a fundamental challenge. And if it's a fundamental challenge for us, it was also a fundamental challenge for Jesus. The scripture says, he was tempted in every way that we are tempted, and yet without sin, without faltering, without stumbling, without losing sight of who he was, and staying true to his calling that the Father had given him. This is all part of, of the process that Jesus goes through. And so this basis of identity, this grounding in who we are, it is always under contest. How many people here have ever had that experience of questioning Am I good enough? Am I walking it out? Was my conversion real? Am I in the kingdom? Does the Father accept me? This kind of interior dialogue is symptomatic of the things that most of us know uh, is experientially. But you know, the scripture goes on and it, it uses another word for Jesus. The word is icon. It's spelled a little differently than the way we spell it in English because it's Greek in the original language. But anyway, an icon is meant to be a representation of something. And the scripture says that Jesus is the exact representation of God's nature. He is an icon of God. And so as the son, he becomes the firstborn of many brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters who are themselves destined to become icons of him. Not merely uh, brothers or even fraternal twins, but exact representations of who he is. That's part of the calling into convergence. That's what God intends for us to do and to be. That's part of why the church is supposed to be a prophetic church. That's 
part of why the church is to be a healing church. That's why the church is to be a miraculous church, because Jesus represents all of these things and did all of these things, and nothing has changed in terms of his own nature. The scripture says he's the same yesterday, <clears throat> yesterday, today, and forever. But now that we've said all of that, there's a problem. And that problem is called sin. It's a, just a small little thing. Um, it's what brings death into our world. And many times people ask, why did so-and-so have to die? And the answer is because there is sin in the world and it taints all human beings. No matter who they are, no matter what color they are, no matter what nation they're from, no matter what language they speak, it taints everybody. And it's not just that it will bring you to death. Jesus said this, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave, is a slave of sin or a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever, but the son remains forever. Mm -hmm. So everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. We find ourselves in bondage, in captivity, in slavery, something we can't break out of. And it holds us until we are freed. And so Jesus continues, he says, so if the son makes you free or sets you free, then you will be free indeed. There is, there is the possibility in God of transformation. There is the possibility of change, of finding that center that you were created for. And Paul picks up this theme in Galatians chapter 5 when he says, it is for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm or stand fast and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Don't come back under that sin that contained you. Don't adopt the false identity that wants to overtake you, but instead walk in who you are. Now, if we look at the book of Galatians, which I'm not in at the moment, so let me go there. Of course I'm not there. In the book of Galatians, it says this, In chapter 4, the book of Galatians says, chapter 4, verse 1, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave. Now, Jesus had just said that the one, uh, the one, the slave does not live in the house forever, but the son does remain forever. But Paul says that the heir, the son, the daughter, as long as he is a child, as long as she is a child, is actually no different from a slave. And so there is a process we go through as we grow into the fullness of who God wants us to be. There's a process. Some people want it to be, I believe and I'm instantly different. Well, you are instantly different because you've been born again, but are you living out of that reality? Maybe not. Sometimes that takes a while as people lay hold of, apprehend that identity they've been given. And so Paul even picks this up. So we've got someone who's an heir, they're a son or a daughter, but as long as they're a child, as long as they're immature, they actually don't function any differently from someone who's a slave who's still living in sin. And if you've ever uh, been a young believer, I assume everyone's been through that phase, or maybe some of you here aren't even converted yet. If you've ever been through that process, you know there can be a period of time where you fight with the appetites of the flesh. You fight with certain attitudes. You fight with things that hold you back. Now again, I said this is meant to be a prophetic weekend and it'll get, it'll get more prophetic, but I'm trying to lay a foundation here. It's something we don't talk about very much because everybody wants to know, what do I have to do to become prophetic? And the answer is you have to live in convergence. Amen. If you're not living in convergence, that's, that thing is gonna fall over. And at best, you'll be a false prophet. So, as long as this person is living like a child, which is to say living like a slave, which is to say reverting to old habits and attitudes, reverting to old patterns of behavior, things that the Bible terms sinful, defective, broken, fallen, inconsistent with the identity of who you are, as long as that's going on, you're actually not much different than a slave, even if you're born again. Now think about all the people you've known that when, especially they're young believers, or even sometimes they're, they've been along at it for a few years and they keep stumbling over all that they are supposed to be. 
Well, it goes on, Paul says, this person is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father, presumably in a will or a trust or something. Why does that happen? Because we know not to trust you when you're young. If we give you too much money, you're going to go out and you know, buy cocaine in a fast car. That's what's going to happen. And in the same way, we also, when we were children, we were enslaved to the elemental principles of the world. Now the word there is actually referring to evil spirits that function through worldly systems and beliefs. But you remain enslaved when you are young. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons, so that we might be incorporated into the family of God, so that we might lay hold of and hang on to the identity that we have as a son, as a daughter. And because you are sons and daughters, God has sent the spirit of his own son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son or a daughter. And if a son or daughter, then an heir through God. And formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those things that are by nature not God's. But they sure act like it. They sure want to dominate you like it. They sure want to take possession of you as though they were. But now that you have come to know God, or rather be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless stoicheia whose slaves you want to become once more. What happens there? That's when somebody, it's when Satan gets in. It's, it's what he was trying to do with Jesus in the wilderness. Can I turn this guy back so that he, not that Jesus was sinful, but it could be you. And if he could have turned Jesus, can I make him behave like one of those fallen ones who does not understand his identity? And so that's the process that, Paul is describing in Galatians 4. We don't often think about that, but especially in those early periods of time, there's this back and forth. Am I a son? Am I a daughter or not? Well, today I think I am. This afternoon, not so much. Tonight, definitely not. I'm going out on the town. Uh, tomorrow morning, I hit the reset button and repent and try again. And maybe over time it gets better, but there's a battle that's going on. And so the differences between a slave and a son or a daughter are many, but functionally, immature Christians look a lot like non-believers. And I want to suggest to you that maturity in Christ is not a function of time. It's a function of conformity to the image of Christ. It's a function of living into that identity you've been given. I've known people, in fact, I knew a chaplain when I was in college, um, and this guy, he used to get drunk all the time on communion wine, so I guess it was deemed okay. <laughs> anyway, he used to get drunk all the time. Um, let's just say he had a fancy for young co-eds. And he was, um, he was somebody that it didn't take very much, and he would go off on a, on a, on a rage. I'm not talking about somebody who gets a little bit irritated or annoyed. And he would just go off on a rage. And so that guy, even though he was a chaplain, meaning an ordained minister, I would have argued that this guy is an immature believer, if he's even a believer. Yeah. Possibly he wasn't even saved. Yeah. But, but that kind of uh, response is all too common. And so thinking about this language of slaves and sons, a slave is not even in the household of God. He might live in it or around it, but he remains a servant. He doesn't belong to the house. He isn't family. He's an unbeliever. But once somebody becomes a child, there's a progress. There's a progression. And the first stage of childhood is what we call uh, nepios. Now, this is the word from which the British-speaking countries get the word nappy. We use the word diaper. But a nappy is what you put on the very small bottom of a very small child. And we know what nappies do. And that's kind of stage one. We go from slave to a nepios. The next stage, and all these are laid out in various parts of scripture. I'm not walking you through these tonight because when you're trying to give a message, you're just trying to get through the material. Uh, sometimes, sometimes it's better to be brief. But the next stage is we go from nappies to, to briefs. 
and the Greek word is brephos. So we've gone from nepios to brephos. Well, what is a brief? It's, it's like when a child transitions from um, those baby diapers to pull-ups. And when you're potty training kids, you definitely want pull-ups because they're easy to get off when they're you know, running to the toilet to, to get trained. All right, so we go from being a nappy, uh, nappy garb to brief garb. The next stage is we've gotten rid of the briefs, thank God, and now we are, um, we might call them uh, kiddies, little kids. This is kindergarten through the early primary grades, maybe up through third grade, fourth grade, something like that. And the scripture says that these are people who understand their sins have been forgiven. They are starting to have an identity rooted in who they are, whom God has called them to be. But as with young children that are kind of in that age, roughly maybe four up to nine years old or so, <clears throat> in that interval of time, uh, sometimes there are accidents at school. And uh, a lot of times kids like this, they revert to childish behaviors in a moment of trial or crisis, but they're moving along. They're, they're growing into who they really are supposed to be. As they move up beyond the, the primary grades, and maybe we could say they're kind of late primary, uh, fifth, sixth grade, we have something called junior high, seventh, eighth grade. Um, when we get up to this area, um, these are the paideia, <clears throat> and the scripture says of these, they've gone beyond mere forgiveness of sin to where they are actually beginning to know the Father. And this is, this is they understand the ways of the Father. It's not just that they can say the words, but they understand the heart of the Father. Moses said when he was in his encounter with God on the mountain, he said, um, teach me your ways in order that I may find favor in your sight. Now God had already told him he had favor in his sight. Why? Well, because every father loves his little kids. But do those little kids walk in the ways of the father? Maybe not so much until they get a little bit older, and now they're consciously trying to model themselves after their father. They want to live this way because they know it pleases him. And with that, there's a, there's a closeness that grows uh, between the children and the father. And so at this stage, the scripture says they've gone beyond mere forgiveness of sin to knowing the Father, but they are not yet overcoming the evil one. That's the important thing at this stage. So again, late primary, junior high, maybe into the early years of high school. This phase, by the way, is described in 1 John 2.13, and the one before it where you grow up into a, a technon, that's the singular form. Uh, this is mentioned in 1 John 2.12. So these two verses follow each other. The very progression is embedded in John's letter, 1 John 2.12 and 2.13. And then ultimately you hit high school and maybe college. And so as we grow up from being a, um, a child who's in that kind of early teen period, we move up to being, the word is neoniskos or neoniskoi in the plural. These are young men or young women. These are youth, teenagers, and these are the ones who overcome the evil one. These are the ones for whom the passions of the flesh, the desires of the world are no longer holding on to them. Now, I've laid this out in a chronological manner because I'm trying to help you associate what I'm saying to phases of child development with which you're familiar. But that's not the same thing as saying it needs to take you 10 years to get there. Because this can happen as a process of spiritual growth, whereby some people are, you know, maybe they're a year or so in the Lord, and they're stronger than the chaplain I was describing, whom I knew back in my college years. And so we can disconnect the chronology of it and look at our own phases of development. Now, this is all extremely important because it says that these who are in this phase, they know the Father, and they have overcome the evil one. This is the stage at which we start thinking about mature believers, people who are walking in victory. They're no longer tossed in, to and fro by winds of doctrine. They're no longer uh, easily tempted. I'm not saying they're beyond temptation, but they're no longer easily tempted by the, um, the things of the world. 
And so the essence of spiritual maturity, as, we, as we've defined it, is to walk into freedom. God wants his people free. I had a really interesting experience in China a few years ago. We were in a room a little bigger than this one. It was, it was deeper. It was about this wide, but it was deeper. Um, and because it was China and there was persecution uh, already coming from the government, it's gotten worse since, and actually uh, the leaders of that church told me that it was unsafe for me to come back because there's so many security cameras that if I were seen as a white person anywhere other than the central business district where they might expect Western travelers to be found, uh, they would immediately track down, why is this white person here? And let's go find out who he's visiting. Because there's security cameras everywhere. And they said, you know, even if we put you in a costume or a disguise, maybe rub some shoe polish on your face or you know, give you a hat with a broad brim that you can put down over your face. Just all of that would be enough that when the security cam sees it, they're gonna, they're gonna focus on that area. Can I ask everyone to silence their phones? Okay. So anyway, we're in this room and uh, to get there, we had to go down this below grade thing and there was, the door was back there just like that door is back there. But it wasn't, it wasn't like a, a ballroom or a conference room as you're in tonight. There was just one single door into that facility, which of course, if you got raided, means there's no way to escape. But it also means they can post somebody and try to figure out who's coming in and going out and restrict the flow of people. So anyway, the meeting was underway and we, uh, there was a woman there who had been struggling for years with a particular physical problem. She was bent over and couldn't stand up. And as it turned out, it was coincidental, I think. Like the woman in the Bible, she had not been able to stand up for 16 years. And so they wanted me to pray for this woman, so I walked over to her and prayed with her while the band was playing some worship. And the Lord touched her and healed her. And I had a couple of the teenage uh, women help me pray with her. So she gets, she gets healed of her condition and she stands upright and begins jumping and dancing around. And of course, everyone in the church knows this woman. It's an underground <laughs> church. And so the place goes crazy. Now, if you didn't catch what I said, we're in an underground, what amounts to a bunker. It's a sealed room. And there's only one door and it's closed and there's somebody standing watch to make sure that you know, no one is trying to get in who shouldn't be in here as a spy, maybe. And uh, so we're in this sealed room uh, below grade, and all of a sudden two people just walked right through the wall. And they were holding this large banner of Chinese characters. And yeah, I don't read Chinese at all, but anyway, they told me, uh, the English speakers in the room, they told me that what the characters said was, God wants his people free. Amen. And so they walked from back there and they got about halfway through the room and they threw this banner on the floor and then they walked right out that through that wall and vanished. Well, they were two angels. And everyone in the room saw them, just to be clear. So someone's going to say, wait a minute, what are you saying here? Remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, at one time Jesus appeared to more than 500 people at once. Now, admittedly, that's Jesus, but, but the scripture says that, you know, these angels appear be times, and so this was one of those moments. So they left this banner on the floor, so the believers grabbed it and brought it up and hung it on the front wall of the church, these Chinese characters, God wants his people free. And when we walked out of there that night, it was still there, and as I understand it, um, it's still hanging there. Wow. Well, that's kind of an interesting story, right? <laughs> but... I mean, it's interesting for a lot of reasons. By the way, for those of you that are staggering through unbelief at that story, remember that the tablets that Moses put in the ark were inscribed by the very finger of God. So can a supernatural item persist? Yes. Is it common? Probably not. But anyway, this is what happened. So 
My point in telling the story, though, is not to wow you with a story that's off theme or off topic. It's to tell you God's so serious about this, he sent two angels into a room with a banner that in their language said to them, God wants his people free. Amen. Now that's part of your identity. If you're a son or a daughter, you should be able to say, God wants me free. Amen. Whatever's binding me, whatever holds me, whether it's, you know, whether it's a lust, whether it's anger, whether it's you know, greed, whether it's whatever it is, God wants me free. It's supposed to be my birthright. And if I'm still bound by it, that's not a source of condemnation. It's to say, maybe I'm still in grade school in my faith. Or maybe I've never yet become a believer. Maybe I'm not yet a son or daughter, and so I'm still a slave. And if I'm a slave, I'm captive. And if I'm captive, I'm in bondage. That's what it's telling us. Amen. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. So we see, we see this progress that the scripture lays out. And with it, we can understand that the third thing Paul talked about here in Galatians is that there came a fullness of time, a pleroma, a fulfillment, when God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. And although he was the son of God, God allowed Jesus to go through the same cycle of growth that we have to go through. Now, he didn't have the sin problem, but nevertheless, he went through a cycle of growth because in addition to being divine, he also becomes our divine pattern we are supposed to understand that as he was, so also with us. Amen. And so the express objective in his coming was to free us from the bondage to these elemental spirits of the world, as we noted when we read it in Galatians. And his objective was that we, as sons and daughters, uh, that we would become part of that same process of becoming an icon, an exact representation, of who God is on the earth. Now, this, under, this concept is very well understood in the Eastern churches. In fact, I had some conversation while I was in Jordan, not just with Pentecostal leaders, which was the primary group that brought me in, but with some Eastern Orthodox uh, monks and uh, priests. And in the Eastern Orthodox traditions, they clearly understand this process of us becoming like icons. We particularly dislike this in the West because as soon as we hear it, it sounds to us like legalism and bondage. You have to follow these rules. No, the whole point of it is we don't do it by rules. We do it from identity. We do it because it's who we are. You know, somebody once wrote that part of how dogs glorify God is through their dogness. You say, well, what is their dogness? I don't know, it's that wagging tail. It's that chasing the ball. It's the you know, jumping up and being happy when they see their master, all of that is the very nature of what dogs do. The dogness of a dog glorifies God. Well, the, the sonness of a son, the daughterness of a daughter glorifies God, and God wants to perfect that expression through us. Does that make sense? Okay. So, God set a time in history, a trigger point, when he decided to redeem those who were caught in this kind of bondage. The fourth thing Paul says is that notwithstanding this magnificent plan, there are uh, many who have been ransomed who turn back again. Sometimes they do it through deception. Sometimes they do it because somebody wants to take control of them and dominate them. And perhaps they're not yet strong enough. Think of a little kid trying to stand up to somebody who's much stronger than they are, an adult. Kids are easily you know, manipulated, and misled, and so forth. That's why we protect them from people who might be predators. And so with that, we can understand that, if, especially when we're in those formative years, however long it takes, again, it might be a matter of months, but we're in that formative stage, that time, we can easily be taken off the track and led into some eddy, some backwater, anything to keep us from moving on to that place of maturity. But you know, Paul says, not in Galatians, but in Romans, there is a guaranteed outcome to all of this. He says in Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Now, not 
so much unto salvation. Watch the language. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That word image is the word icon. He made you in order that you would become an exact representation of who Jesus is. Now I said, tonight my goal is to try to give you a brief manifesto of who you are and why you're on earth. And I just told you the answer. God made you so that you would be conformed to the image of his son, that you would become like his son. But there's a lot of things that can get in the way. And so part of the process of overcoming, part of the process of growing up, is to overcome all of that. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of Son, in order that he, the Son, might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What this means is, if you're a believer... You can fight this and resist it, and you can have a really miserable life doing that. You can spend your whole life fighting and resisting God on these fundamental issues. They'll stop you from joy. They'll stop you from victory. They'll stop you from power. They'll stop you from purpose. They'll lead you into depression, despair, suicide, anxiety, and right on down the line. You can do all that if you want to. But what God has said is he's putting his own reputation on the line, and he's saying, David, I'm putting you on a tractor beam. You can't escape this thing. Sooner or later, you're going to end up looking like Jesus. And so the only question is, how soon is that going to happen? A lot of people wait until they die. And so you know, they live their life kind of down here, and then they just think, Bleep! when I die, it's all going to be great. But God's intention is to be more like, Bleep! and now we live on a higher plane. Yes. We live as people who have been freed from slavery. We're no longer dominated by the stoicheia. And with that, we come to our last point, which is what Paul says in Romans 8.14. This is one of my favorite verses, and interestingly enough, somebody recently signed a book for me and put Romans 8.14 in it. I took that as a prophetic thing in and of itself because there's no way this individual would have known that. But Romans 8.14 says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons and daughters of God. Amen. So the, the higher expression of the Christian life is to be a Spirit-filled, Spirit-led Christian. Yes. No longer dominated by those passions. No longer dominated by those teachings. No longer dominated by the things of the world. You move beyond... You move beyond the, the briefs. You move beyond the nappies. You move beyond all of that. You've gotten beyond grade school. You understand that you are in fellowship with the Father, and with it you are overcoming the evil one in your daily uh, living. And with it, you start to wreak havoc on the evil one. Because think of it, who do we recruit to be in our Army or Navy or Air Force? Generally young people, right? They're strong, they're fit, they're, I don't know, they're not round like I am. <laughs> they're, they're in shape. They, you know, they're at the height of their physical prowess. And so with all of that, such individuals wreak havoc on the kingdom of darkness. Those who are led by the Spirit of God will find themselves led sometimes into dark places not to be tempted, but rather to wreak havoc on the darkness itself. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Well, we started out by saying um, that, that in the scripture we see God's purpose for us. And I, I started it with the framing remark that you are all sons of God or daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And we said there's a guaranteed outcome, but in this world, in this life, in the now, it's the intention of God that we would be spirit-filled people who live under the leading of the spirit. And with that, too, we look like Jesus. Jesus said, I don't do anything the Father doesn't show me to do. Yeah. And so my Father is always at work, and I, too, am working. Yeah. So for a lot of people, they go, I don't know why I'm here on this world, on this earth, in this world. Well, you're here because your Father wants you to do good works that will bring him glory. Amen. 
And what do those good works look like? Well, look at the life of Jesus. They look like setting others free. They look like walking in freedom from sin so that others can see, oh, I don't have to live in that bondage. I know somebody who doesn't live in bondage. And well, they can do it. Maybe I could have that too. And so we create a kind of a spiritual hunger around us or a vortex because we become ourselves icons. We are the living embodiment of the very uh, of the very things that God designed us to do and be. That's really what we're supposed to be about. And with that, you now understand your purpose in life. Now, how you earn your living, that's a totally different question, <laughs> right? Some people may be truck drivers or plumbers. Some may be accountants or developers. Some may be lawyers and some may be teachers. Some may be nurses. All of that's interesting and it will have a lot to do with your own proclivities and inclinations, desires that God has put inside of you. But all of those things in the end are actually quite secondary to the fundamental calling we have to live as sons and daughters of the kingdom Amen. and to carry this identity where we go and to show it to others and to be light in the world. Amen. Jesus actually said this, didn't he? He said, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hid. And so with that, for many of us, it's time to get the light burning brightly again. Amen. It's time to walk away from the things that have held us back. It's time to become sons and daughters of the Amen. kingdom. Amen. Amen? Amen? All right. Now, my timer says I talked 38 minutes, so I, I made it under 40. I'm not sure how long I was talking before I realized, so I guess all up we're probably in the neighborhood of an hour. Uh, anyway, forgive me for, uh, for talking long if I did. Um, before we move to ministry, let me just ask, does anyone have any questions they'd like to throw out? Because I, I know this was a probably meatier theological talk than you came expecting to hear. But again, I wanted to build a platform uh, for what else we're going to do this weekend. Yeah. Okay, there's a hand in the back. I don't know if we have a roving mic, though, so you might need to cup your hands and kind of shout it out a little bit. Uh, Nepios, Brefos, uh, let me think, uh, Technon and Paideia. I want to make sure I have Technon and Paideia in the right order. Yeah, Technon and Paideia. So, uh, uh, Brefos are the briefs, they're the little baby diapers. The, no, 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 sorry, the nappies, the Nepios, there we go. See, I did just come in from Oman. So the nappies are the first stage, the briefs are the second stage. Eventually, you get rid of all the diapers in whatever form they are. And <laughs> then we become a technon that's kind of a maybe kindy or pre-kindy through third or fourth grade. And from there, we become paideia, uh, which are the upper grades, of maybe through junior high school. And finally, we become neoniskoi, which um, are the young adults and the sort of full bloom and the glory of young men and young women. All right, I see the hand back there. Hey there, I got a mic, so. How about Ooh. that? <laughs> it's exciting. Okay, so we went all the way up to college, and it's my understanding now that that's not quite adulthood, but just nearly there. Are there markings of proper adulthood in the kingdom of heaven, or is that for like a later time? That's a really good question. Uh, I don't know. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, when people, let's just say, let's just say this. Many times when people go to college, uh, it becomes a, an opportunity for them to diverge from the teachings of their parents. They sort of go crazy in in multiple ways. But once they graduate from college, what do we normally expect them to do? Get a job. And that implies responsibility. When you get a job, you've got to learn how to manage your time well enough to get to work on time. You've got to learn how to do your laundry, which maybe your mother always did for you. I mean, when I was in college, I had friends who had this gigantic and growing pile of dirty clothes in the corner of their room. 
and they literally never did their laundry. They just had lots and lots of clothes that their parents had provided to them. And when they would go home, they would just throw it all in some giant, you know, like a, like a Santa Claus bag, and they'd bring it home and drop it at mom's feet. And mom would do all the laundry, and they'd bring it right back to school and start on it again. That is not responsible behavior, but people do it. Anyone here have any kids who do that to you? This is Texas. There's a lot of them in California, and Connecticut, and New York. Anyway. <laughs> so when you get out of college, you start taking responsibility. So what does that look like? It looks like becoming somebody who is now reproducing. Isn't that something else people do? They graduate from college, they often get married. Nowadays, unfortunately, they don't always get married. They start having children. And so with that, now they've got to start raising new children. So we become people in the kingdom who replicate the very things that we have come to understand and walk in. And with that, the young children, the young believers that are coming along behind us, we raise them, we train them, we teach them the word, we teach them competencies of life, we teach them the spiritual gifts. This is what Christians should be doing. It's one of the reasons I would say that the church isn't further along right now in terms of you know the revival that we've been talking about for a generation because so many people are not actually taking on the responsibilities and competencies of, of adults within their own churches and faith communities. Instead, they just sit in the pews and they want to get fed every week and they watch their YouTubes of whichever preacher they like. But are they actually doing anything? Yeah. Not so much. Not so much. So that, that's what goes after the college age or the neoniscoi stage of life. I see, a, I see a highball sign. She liked the answer. That's good. All right. Uh, hang on. Where is the mic? Jose, I see your hand. I don't see, oh, right there. You're in the shadow. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I can't question, see you, but I can hear you. Okay. <laughs> so my question is, how do you balance the pro proclivities about yourself, <clears throat> but yet um, not being objectional, objectional about who you are? when things come against you, uh, when there's setbacks that come against you, when there's trials that come against you, and still have that belief in the back of your mind or that voice of reason is saying, I am a child of God. Well, I know it's like two questions. And yeah, you're asking a good question also, and it's a really important one because people, particularly people who've come from broken backgrounds, or lives of deep sin, uh, there is a conflict between the reality that they are now a child of God, male or female, and the life that they may still be living or reverting to periodically. And many become stuck in this kind of primary grade age, and they never really break out of it. But the reason I wanted to talk about this tonight is because for a lot of people who are stuck, <clears throat> they need to let the, the true reality of who they are become the dominant reality that yes. frames yes. the way they think and do things. Yes. Yes. Now, I can remember when I was um, eh, probably early high school, and some of the temptations that come to young people started coming my way. Now, my father died when I was young, so I didn't really have a father figure to refer to. But I had a grandfather, and I spent a lot of time with him. My mother would send me to live with her parents for about half the year each year. And so there would come times when these temptations would come to me, and I would literally think in my mind, this may sound really strange and antiquated, but it is what I thought. In my mind, I would think, I can't do that. I'm John Walbert's grandson. Wow. Yeah, that's cool. Wow. Yeah. Well... <laughs> The, the, the clear implication of this is, I can't do that, or I must not do that. If you, I mean, you could actually do it, but I should not do it. I must not do it because I am my father's son. Amen. And so that's really the nature of the conflict that Jesus had in the wilderness. If you are the son, turn the stone into bread. Let your appetites dominate you. Jesus said, no. 
It's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And not only that, I am my father's son, and therefore I will not do this. And it doesn't matter whether in my mind I want to or I feel tempted, I will not yield. And so then the devil tries a different tactic. So we need this identity so grounded into us that when things come our way that are contrary to that, we say no. I mean, it sounds overly simplistic, but just say no. Yeah. Now, many people will say no and then capitulate to it, but that's because it hasn't become wedded enough to the central core of who they are, uh, that they have the, the internal strength, the internal mastery to be able to say no and to call upon their father for help. What do little kids do when they're in trouble? Dad, help! And so dad comes running. I think there is a very real dynamic of that in our relationship with God. When it's authentic and heartfelt, sometimes people just sort of say the words, but they don't really have the intention to follow through. But when a little kid really says, Dad or Mom, and they say it in that tone, Mom or Dad knows, drop what you're doing and go running right now. It's really serious. I think God is that committed to our success. Yeah. I think he really is. Because the Bible says, fear not, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Well, Jesus is talking to those who are listening to him, and he calls them little flock. But he says, he is your father. That means you are sons and daughters. And it is his delight that you would receive the kingdom, walk in the kingdom. This is, this is a promise. It's, a, it's embedded in the nature of the relationship we've been called to. And again, I, I just... It, as I was thinking about tonight, there were so many ways I could have taken sons and daughters of the kingdom. But I did actually pray about it. I tried to hear what my father was saying. And I, and I, I sensed that he really wanted me to reinforce this fundamental idea of I cannot violate who I am because I want to honor my father. Yeah. And who am I? I'm a son. I'm a daughter. And I'm called to live ultimately into convergence that comes out of congruence, that comes out of synergy, that comes out of my identity. I see one down here, but I don't know where the mic is. I have it. That, say that again. Inte identity, integrity. Identity leads to synergy. The synergy leads to congruence. Congruence leads to convergence. And by the way, that convergence is the very thing that I mentioned, Ephesians 1.10. It was the intention of the Father to unite all things in Christ. The idea of uniting, to bringing everything together, that speaks of convergence, doesn't it? And isn't it interesting that today, not like September the 8th, but in this era, in this season of life, so many conferences are popping up called Convergence. I, I think that's a prophetic thing that, that mm -hmm. you know, if you can see the signs, read the signs of the times, I think the Lord is actually trying to draw people into that place of convergence. I'm not sure everybody's understanding all that is implied in that, and not every conference would have this content as its theme. But the idea of convergence is on the wind because our Father is highlighting it. Yes, sir, you're right here. You can just pass the microphone down. <laughs> and there's one back there somewhere. Question. You know, in most churches, there's always this, the, the children or the, the, the carnal man. That seems to dominate a lot of the conversation. How come it's so hard to be an adult or reach that convergence period? I mean, what stops us from growing up? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, does not have an easy answer. There's always been the world, the flesh, and the devil. But I think the bigger problem is that in our time, we don't have many courageous leaders. Amen. I think many, many church leaders are compromised. Yeah. Now, depending on where you come from on the theological spectrum, you may say, I don't see that very much. Okay, fair enough. But if you think of the many different denominations, and I'm not here to call anybody out or you know, start a fight, 
But if you think of the many different denominations, uh, especially we'll just say of the more mainstream, what used to be called the uh, WASPy denominations, or uh, you know White Anglo-Saxon Protestant, that's what WASP stands for. Um, I think a lot of those kinds of churches have ceased to call people to maturity. They've ceased to call them to discipleship. Many of them have ceased to call people to conversion, to even become a son or a daughter. And many of them have become hotbeds of political activism or whatever. But, but the one thing they're not doing is focusing on this. And you know, I could kind of switch gears and go back to the book of 1 Peter. But 1 Peter is very clear that we are to be holy in all we do because our Father is holy. So again, we are to mimic him. We are to become icons of him. And I would say that if you look at the, the substantial body of literature that was produced in the ancient church for maybe the first at least 500 years of Christianity, it probably goes longer, but at least 500 years, one of the primary calls that's in the writings of all the pastoral letters that, are, you know, that came down to us from that era because people were copying them over and over and you know, transmitting them for posterity. Uh, one of the things that we see coming out of the pages of scripture, the book of Hebrews is replete with this kind of language, is a call to maturity, a call to holiness. And so I would say Christian leaders in that first half millennium of Christianity, and arguably beyond, but for sure indisputably the first 500 years, is they were constantly urging people to grow up, grow up in Christ. Adopt the character of Jesus. Adopt the life of Jesus. You know, most of the great saints, if you're from a Catholic persuasion, most of the great saints come from that period. Yeah, there are some that come later, I know. But, but most of the great ones come from that earliest period. And why are they saints? Because they lived the life they were supposed to live, and we are intended to emulate their lives. Not pray to them, not worship them, but emulate them. Take them as examples of piety, of perseverance, of wholesomeness, of fidelity to the faith. And on and on it goes. I mean, we could throw other things in there, but, but you get the idea. And I think that much of the church today has been uh, preempted by other agendas, whether they be political, uh, whether they be sociological, but we've, we've kind of, we, we've become disconnected uh, from the very message of the earliest Christian community, and we've got to come back to that. Amen. Now, that's not the same thing as becoming legalistic, right. but it does say that there are some measuring lines or some metrics we can use to assess whether we are walking in a manner that's pleasing to him. There's plenty of it in the pages of the Bible. You just look at the last couple of chapters of any of Paul's letters, and you're going to run into a lot of this is how you should live, this is how you should live, this is how you should live. But you can't live that life unless you're living out of that convergence that comes from congruence, that comes from synergy, that comes from identity. And so it, it's really the, the fountainhead of all of that victorious living emerges from being centered and grounded. I am a son. I am a daughter. My father will give me the wherewithal to overcome these things and to succeed. And if I fall down once, he'll pick me up. It's like a kid riding a bike and learning to ride a bike. Right? You fell off the bike. Get back on the bike. I'll run alongside you a little further and help you get along. I mean, that's our father's heart. It really is the heart of a father. Okay, yes, sir. I just want to piggyback off of what, you know, what all of you speak of. And as we mature, it's a time when we have to say, Dad, I got it. You can take these training wheels off of her now. Mm -hmm. And let me ride. If I fall, I fall. But let me let me go now. And that goes with the, the illustration you gave about college. The reason so many people in the congregation don't want to show signs of maturity is because they want to reap the rewards of the immaturity and the um the coddling and the you know, oh, he's okay for the mistakes that they make that they shouldn't be making anymore. You know, so now it's time, college is over, it's time for you to go out and get a job. That's right. And that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to, now, as we mature, it's time to not just so much as seek four walls 
to get a word, it's time to go out and do what God has called us to do. That's exactly correct. Exactly correct. Now, what you'll see uh, as we move into tomorrow is that between David and me, a lot of what we're wanting to do is train and equip, and we'll be talking about spiritual gifts in particular, uh, prophecy. And with that, um, we want you to be able to move forth. And, you know, in my mind, gifts are not given to the mature. They're given to the believer. I mean, the Corinthian church, all you got to do is read 1 Corinthians with an open eye, and you'll see these guys were not the, the best examples of Christians that ever lived. At least not then. Maybe they got better later. But anyway. Um, and so this is akin to a little kid who wants to go out and help dad in the workshop. You know, on his workbench. Now you're not going to necessarily hand that kid a bandsaw. Or, a, you know, <laughs> that might be dangerous. So maybe the Lord withholds some of that. But you can give a kid a screwdriver. You can give him a hammer. Let him start, you know, banging away and getting accustomed to what this is. And so there's, there's also growth in the gifts. Um, and there's a question of which gifts are bestowed when. Um, this weekend's primarily about the prophetic. But again, you will not mature in the prophetic. You will not mature in miracles. You will not mature in healing. You will not mature in anything if you don't have this identity thing sorted out. Because sooner or later what will happen, and this I've seen this happen many times, is people will begin to adulate you. They will begin to worship you. They will begin to deify you because of the, the grace of God flowing through your life. And what did Paul and Barnabas do when this happened to them in the middle of central Turkey? They said, hey, stop! We are men just like you are! But people will want to do that. And the risk that will happen is if you're not centered in this identity of who you are as a son or a daughter, you might actually fall for that. And the next thing you know, you'll become somebody, well, we tend to call them cult leaders. Or you'll become a dangerous person because you'll start feeding on that attention. Cult leader is a little further out than narcissist, but there are plenty of narcissistic church leaders, aren't there? So the, the danger is you come unhinged from that identity. So you generally, you know, you prove your faithfulness in little things and you are given greater things. All right. Uh, maybe it's one last question there. Okay. It's his son, yes. Um, I have a question about blocks to maturity. And the reason I'm asking is because when I was at your meeting over in Garden Oaks, I came down for prayer and didn't know that I was dealing with the spirit of shame. And that was cast away that night. And it totally has changed my life. So I know that's one block. But what are things that will stop us in that maturation process? Well, um, I don't know that these are in order. Because I didn't. <laughs> you never know what people are going to ask. But... One of the blocks is, first of all, not understanding the objective, so we've kind of covered that. Now that you know the objective, uh, you may not realize that your own brokenness is holding you back. Because depending on the environment you've been raised in, you may view that brokenness as not only normal, but acceptable. So why do I need to change anything? And the answer is, well, because God says it's not acceptable. How dare you say that? Well, I didn't say it. God said it. But you see, when, as soon as you get that response to it, you realize mm, there's, there's something here that's unfinished business. So there may be personal brokenness. Sometimes there's demonic blockage, as, as you described having. And when there are demons present, there's this particular gift of the Spirit called discerning of spirits that God gives to the church. And you would expect it among prayer ministers to manifest periodically as needed so that they can discern that there are evil spirits and dispatch them, and then they can be removed. Uh, sometimes there may be other things. Many times people find themselves in bondage from having committed sins that they didn't even know were wrong, and the lingering residue of that needs to be cleaned up in order that more of God's grace and power can flow. Now, was everything done at the cross? Everything that you need was provided at the cross, but not everything that you need may have been downloaded to you uh, 
even at your conversion, it may have been like, you know, sometimes you download something on your phone or your tablet and it hangs up. It doesn't just all come in and you got to redo it or turn the thing off and restart it. So now and then people have those sorts of things where they didn't, they didn't maybe receive the full package of what God has available. So these might be some of the reasons that uh, people can, can run into trouble. Um, again, I'll say something I already said, but it, it, it's relevant. Many times today, we have spiritual leaders who will not speak into the difficult, thorny issues. And as a result, people who may be stuck with something very specific, they are not called to forsake that or to seek the grace of God that they may be released from it. But I, I think the thing that you want to take away from this question, and this is true for all of us, is that we serve a gracious Father. And so there's nothing he's going to withhold from us as long as we ask for it. But you know, sometimes people will give you a gift and you don't actually use it for a while. You ever had that happen? <laughs> My kids gave me a pair of socks. <laughs> Dad gift. Uh, my kids gave me a pair of socks a little while back, and, and initially I kind of looked at them and I'm like, these are really, these are interesting socks. They had dark Vader on them. <laughs> anyway, um, but I thought, well, what the heck? My kids gave them to me. I'm going to wear them anyway. Uh, so, but for for a period of time, they sat unused, and many times God will give us a gift that, that would be just what we need in order to find freedom and breakthrough no longer to live as slaves, but as sons and daughters. But if we don't access that, if we don't unwrap that gift, and why might we not do that? Well, we may not actually want to live in that new identity yet. Or we may not believe it's going to work. Or we may not understand the full implications of what it is. So all of these are part of that process of growth that we go through. But again, we're trying to take you to a place where you're walking at a more, in a more substantial way, and many of these things that, that can cling to you and hold you back, they fall off of you. And with that, hopefully you find a greater place of breakthrough and victory. Can we get one more quick one right here? Okay, one back, one at the back there. Yes, sir. I want to ask you, I've done a lot of study in this area. In Exodus 20, it talks about the iniquities of the father fall on, you know, the different generations going down. I see that we need more discipleship, like you said, discernment that we can deal with. You know, in psychology, you're gonna call it character flaws, but their iniquities or learned behaviors from the broken family. I'd like you to address that, please. Well, sometimes it's more than learned behaviors. I mean, it certainly can be learned behaviors. I wouldn't, I wouldn't discount that. But sometimes, the, the word iniquity, abone in Hebrew, um, refers to something that is passed on in the bloodline. It's like a corruption of the genetics. It's a mutation in, in our genetic code. And, and I would argue that because of the nature of sin, we're worse off today than we were, say, when Adam and Eve yes. fell. Yeah. Because we've had who knows how many generations, at least a hundred or more, maybe, maybe several hundred, maybe even several thousand, generations of people where there's been more and more brokenness and further entrenchment of wrongdoing of various types. I mean, we have murder early on in the story of, of Genesis, but, but it could be more than, than murder. Um, but it keeps getting sown into the generations. And with that, as the scripture says, you sow to the wind, you reap the whirlwind. And I don't think we've taken that seriously enough. And so one of the things that in our ministry, we found that uh, people who come out of families with these t sorts of, I'm going to call them pathologies, right. today we justify them and mainstream them and say, well, these are just peccadillos. It's not that big a deal. The Bible says what we confess, God will, you know, we put it in the light, then God can heal it. But if we say it's okay, think of the whole conversation around the LGBTQ movement. If we say it's okay, we leave people in that bondage. Now, I know sometimes people struggle with that, and it may take something to overcome it, but there is an overcoming grace. There is an overcoming power. If all we ever say is, that's fine, it's okay, we're going to protect it legally, and we're going to endorse it, no one's ever going to get free of that. And you know, I'll, never mind, I don't want to sound like I'm bashing gay, so let me, let me train my guns on one of my wife's pet peeves. 
during COVID, all the stores and everything in our area were closed, except for the grocery stores and the gas stations. Uh, but, but everything else was closed, with one single exception. Liquor stores and pot shops. Yeah. My wife was saying, you know, what are we doing? Why do we have pot shops open, but the churches are closed? What's going on with that? Well, what's going on with that is that the government has made licit what everybody has known for decades is bad. We, we've known for, for, for many decades, maybe not centuries, that would be an overstatement. But we've known for about 100 years or so that you know cocaine is not good for you, that marijuana is a gateway drug. And if you use it, you may develop anxiety, your productivity goes down, you become less focused. All of these things are, but, but the people want it. So we'll give them games and food. That's what they used to say in, in Rome. So give them the pot that they want. And, and it will drug the whole population and have them live in that state. And we'll put laws in place to say it's perfectly fine to do it. So again, I'm not just gay bashing here. I'm talking about the entire implosion of a society because we've decided to embrace something that's absurd destructive. So there are many things like this where people, they, they just put structures in place to make licit what is wrong. And so again, I keep saying to people, we've got to return to what the Bible says. I really don't care what the state of Texas says or what the state of California says when it comes to these kinds of matters. Now when it comes to speed limits and things, sure, we should obey the law. But I'm talking about things like this. It's very clear that we are, we are endorsing and allowing moral hazard to overtake our society and nobody wants to say a word about it. All right, Delia, you're standing there like you want me to get off the platform. No, I just, uh, as we're gonna transition to a time of ministry, um, we just wanna thank Ken for his, um, his teaching and pouring into us. So we're going to take up an offering and um, the, could we put the um, QR code up on the screen again if you want to scan that and, and make an offering that way. Um, we're also passing around baskets and if you'd like to make a check you can make them payable to Orbis Ministries. Um, and you know Ken and David come here. They don't get paid. There is no honorarium. They come here because the Lord has sent them here. He's sent them here to sow into each of us and into our communities. So if um, you feel blessed tonight and you would like to bless this ministry and sow into it, we invite you to do so. Thank you. The prayer team, please come to the front. Thank and we've got some uh, leaders from Orbis Ministry. I know some of you guys have come from around the country. Come on up. We're going to need the prayer team. So it's about <clears throat> not quite 10 to 9. I'm not sure when we have to be out of this room, but I think we've got a, a, a fair bit of runway for uh, ministry time. After a message like this, I think 
we almost have to give an altar call for those who have not been living into their identity. And it could be because you didn't know what it was, now you do. So now you're responsible for that information. It could be because you've been running from it, having been told it somewhere, and with it you've made choices that are contrary to your identity. And you've broken God's heart doing that, but you've also hurt yourself. We talk about self-harm. Well, this is a form of self-harm. It may not involve razor blades or something, but it's nevertheless very harmful to us. So uh, that might be a reason. Um, you may have been fighting with God. There are stories in the Bible of people who fought with God for years. Moses did. Later on, Jacob did. I mean, so... You wouldn't be the first, you probably won't be the last, but it's time to surrender, lay down your weapons. So if you have been living not out of identity, and as a result you haven't, you haven't been moving towards convergence. Remember we said convergence comes from congruence, comes from synergy, comes from identity. You haven't been living in that or with that. Um, I wanna invite you to come up now and, and with that, if you have not been born again, this is your opportunity to start the journey as well. So anyone who's not saved, come up with this altar call to receive ministry prayer. And uh, we're going to pray over people and break some bondage and see some people find who they really were meant to be. And by the way, let me just say this. I don't know why I feel prompted to say it, but I do. Um, if you've been living an outwardly... Um, you know, middle class, respectable life. And internally, you realize I'm a totally immature Christian. I, I can put on the outward facade, but that too is a form of false identity. Um, this is your chance to come up and acknowledge that and hit the reset button as well. So I don't give long altar calls. This is probably about as long as I ever get. Um, come on up now. That's it. There's the altar call. Out of your seats, on your feet.